dad had other plans for him. His dad wanted him to be in the military, to be in the army, because his grandfather had been in the military, and his great-grandfather had been in the military. His great-grandfather had served in the Revolutionary War, and his dad was really proud about that. Joshua, however, was super involved in his church. He went to all the prayer meetings and was involved in the choir at his church and loved the things of God. But instead of continuing his theological education, he believed God had other things for him. And so he enrolled in a school called Bowdoin College and began to study ancient languages. While at Bowdoin College, he met many people that influenced his life, and one of the people that impacted him the most was Harriet Beecher Stowe. She was the author of Uncle Tom's Cabin. Of course, at that time in our nation's history, there was great debate about the issue of slavery. And so Joshua would oftentimes find himself in these little rooms where Harriet Beecher Stowe would share her stories about the horrors of slavery. And this impacted Joshua greatly. Well, he ended up graduating from Bowdoin College and then applying at that same school to be a teacher at that school. He was accepted, and then he began to share with his his students about the dangers and the horrors of slavery and how it was corroding America and how slavery was such a blight on the United States for us being a righteous nation. Joshua, as he began to share with his students, something inside him began to well up within him. He began to be convicted of this one thing. I can't just talk about something. I have to do something about it. Well, Joshua found himself as a 34-year-old man. He was married, had a couple of kids, and he did the only thing he knew he could do. He wrote to the governor of Maine, lived in Maine, and these are his words. I fear this war, so costly of blood and treasure, will not cease until men of the north are willing to leave good positions and sacrifice the dearest personal interest to rescue our country from desolation and defend the national existence against treachery. And at that moment... He signed up to be a soldier in the Union Army. He didn't just talk about something, he actually did something about it. Now, Joshua, a year or two later, found himself in the most decisive battle of the war. He found himself as a colonel, a lieutenant colonel in the military at Gettysburg. If you don't know much about Gettysburg, it was the decisive battle of the war. There were over 300,000 people that were in Pennsylvania that were on hills and and all throughout the area, and they were fighting for the territory. Well, Joshua finds himself being ordered to go on top of this hill. It's called Little Round Top. And his orders were to go and to take the hill. Well, nobody was on the hill And that's why this hill was so important. See, the Union officers and the Confederate officers knew that if they could control this hill, that they would be able to control the fate of the battle. And so Joshua was tasked to go and to take the hill to get to it as quickly as possible so they could fortify it and have the defenses. Well, Joshua and his men, they rushed up there. Well, His men that he had were about 300 men, and they rushed up to the top of the hill. And as they got there, they had to now hold the hill. The Confederates, realizing the importance of this hill, they began to charge Joshua's men. Joshua's men were outnumbered at least two to one. Some historians say maybe even as many as three to one. And as bullets were flying back and forth, Joshua's men held them off time and time again. Not did they, they didn't only just charge once or twice or three times. They charged five different times because the Confederates knew how important this hill was. Now Joshua finds himself and his men at their lowest peak. They had lost half of their men. There was about 150 of them left. They're wounded and and discouraged. 
They have no more ammunition. And they can see the Confederates lining up once again to come. And this time, they knew that they weren't going to be able to repel the Confederate soldiers. And then they received word that they weren't able to receive reinforcements. Joshua knew this was his defining moment. He knew that it was over. There was nothing else that could be done. He'd given everything that he could. And then something struck him. A moment in time where he issued orders that still baffle those historians who look at this battle. He looked at his men. He got on top of the rocks that the Confederate soldiers had put up as barriers. He got up on that rock, lifted up his sword, and he said, bayonets, charge! And he went rushing down the hill into the fray of battle. Well, all of his soldiers knew that this was either do or die, and so they rushed down the mountains. And within five minutes, they completely destroyed the Confederate army that was approaching them. They had won the Battle of Gettysburg. All because of one young man, 34-year-old professor, a teacher, who made one critical decision. I'm not just going to talk about something, I'm going to do something. I'm not just going to do something, I'm going to charge. You see, it's the little things in life that create, I believe, the biggest change in our hearts. There are little things that you do every single day that build up to great things in your life. And oftentimes we miss the little things in life at the expense of wanting the great things. Would you join with me in prayer? Father, I pray right now in the name of Jesus that you would open up our ears, that you would open up our eyes. God, that we would not be so little in our own eyes, that we wouldn't be those that discount the little things that we do. Lord, I pray in the name of Jesus that you would give us the courage and the boldness to reach forward and to reach up for the things that you have for us. God, I pray for this church that we would be filled with great courage as you call us to move forward in 2015. If you agree with that, say amen. Okay, I want you to turn to your neighbor and say, I'm going to be a person of courage in 2015. Can you say that this morning? I'm going to be a person of courage. Okay, great. I believe little acts of courage can bring about great change. Little acts of courage can bring about great change. You know, we hear stories like this of men like Joshua, and sometimes I think we can feel just a little bit overwhelmed, and maybe we can say, well, I could never be that bold. I could never charge down a hill when I know that bullets are flying past me. And you may never, ever be in that situation. I hope you're never in that situation. But there are little moments of time where you're going to have the opportunity, where you're going to be faced with an opportunity to either display courage or to display fear. And I believe it's those little moments in time that God is looking down at and he wants you to display great courage. Remember, Joshua was just a simple college professor. He was a 34-year-old man with a wife and kids at home. And yet, he didn't just talk about something, he actually did something with his life. And as the church, if we're not careful, all we become are those who just talk about a lot of things, but don't do a lot of things. See, God wants you to get engaged in his great kingdom. You see, he has great plans in store for you, and he doesn't want you to sit on the sidelines of life. He wants you to be engaged in the front lines of life. He wants you to be out where the battle is, so to speak. He wants you to be an influencer wherever you go. Don't be on the sidelines of life. Be on the front lines, engaging in what God has for you. And now I think about another Joshua that we might be familiar with. And Joshua finds himself leading tens of thousands of people. You see, Moses has just passed away. Moses, who was the great leader of the children of Israel, and now Joshua has been handed the leadership reins. But Joshua's he's inexperienced. 
He's known as that kid who followed Moses around, that kid who went up the mountain with Moses, that kid who really, who is he and what does he really do? And now he's leading thousands and thousands of people. And Joshua, at this point in the story that we're going to be reading, he finds himself on the wrong side of the river. And he sees, as the promised land is in front of him, that there is a walled fortress named Jericho. And he's been tasked by God to go and cross this river. He's been tasked by God to go and destroy Jericho so that they can go and enter into the promised land. But you see, Joshua is fearful. He's afraid. He's, I would almost say, just a little bit intimidated by the task that's in front of him. Do you find yourself intimidated in life? Are there certain seasons of life where you're just a little bit afraid, where you're maybe just a little bit discouraged? You see, God, he speaks to Joshua three separate times in the first chapter of Joshua, which is where this story unfolds. God speaks to Joshua on three occasions, and he says, be strong, be courageous, don't be afraid. And then again, he says, be strong, be courageous, don't be afraid. And then finally, God says this, I've commanded you, be strong, be courageous, don't be afraid. And I believe this is the word for the church for for 2015, be strong, and courageous. Don't be afraid. Reach out and reach up and reach in. This is the word that we have for the year is reach. But I want us to be bold in our proclamation of what God has for us today. I believe God is still speaking that over each one of you. Don't be afraid. Be bold. Be courageous in the things that God has for you. And so Joshua as he begins to hear what God is speaking to him about being bold and being courageous and not being afraid, he still finds the river in front of him. And it's not just any river, it's the Jordan River. And it's not just the Jordan River. The Jordan River is overflowing its banks. And I'm sure he's wondering to himself, but God, how can I get across? And then if I get across, look at this giant, imposing, walled fortress of a city that you're calling me to go and destroy. How can I do it? And I think that's where many of us find ourselves in life. We see the problems in front of us, and they are so great and so big. It's a river that's overflowing its banks. And we look at our life and our circumstance, and we say, how in the world can I ever overcome that? Or we see situations, maybe in our marriage or our finances, where we say it's so difficult. It's so walled off. There's no way and no one who can help me. And Joshua does something very significant that I believe is the key to the little things of God doing great things in his life. In Joshua, he says this, Joshua chapter 3, verse 5. Joshua goes to all the people and he says this. Joshua told the people, consecrate yourselves, for tomorrow the Lord will do amazing things among you. I find that fascinating. Of all the things he could have told the people to do, get ready. Make sure you have all of the armaments that you need. Make sure that you're ready to go. Make sure that the strongest are out in front. Make sure that you've got all your weapons sharpened and everything that you know that you need to do. Make sure that it's ready to go. And Joshua, he doesn't do that. He calls the people together and he says, consecrate yourselves. Set yourself apart is what consecration means to be holy to set yourself apart you see joshua was calling the people to be holy to get into god's presence and to recognize that their problems were never going to be overcome unless they had right relationship with god you see your problems can't be overcome in life unless you have a right relationship with god If you're not consecrated, there are going to be issues in your life that keep you from all that God has for you. And it's on you to consecrate yourself, to set yourself apart so that you can become holy 
and right in God's eyes. It might not seem like it's a big thing, but in God's eyes, it's a big deal. And I believe this is what God is calling many of us to as we're in the middle of this Daniel fast. If you haven't heard, last week I called the church to a two-week Daniel fast. And if you weren't here last week and you missed it, you can join us beginning today. I've just encouraged the church not to eat meats or sweets or bread and to focus our time on seeking the Lord. You see, these are the little things in life. Joshua was going into the greatest battle of his life, and he called the people to do something very simple but yet significant. The simplicity was this. Consecrate yourselves. Dedicate yourselves to the Lord. Because in doing that, they recognized that it was only God who could save them. It was only God who could deliver them, and it was only God who could go with them. You see, when we consecrate ourselves, we recognize that in ourselves we have no strength, we have no power. But when we set ourselves apart, there's like this revelation that says, God, without you, I'm lost. God, without you, I'm hopeless. I can't cross the river. I can't defeat that in my life without you. So, church, I'm encouraging you to consecrate yourself. Take this time of prayer and fasting and get alone with God and begin to ask him to help you with those circumstances and situations that seem so overwhelming. Only God can help you in those things. You see, getting on your knees and seeking God in the quiet moments of your life, that takes courage. People would be like, well, well what do you mean that, that it takes courage just to get on my knees? Yeah, it takes courage because you're confessing, God, I can't do it myself. You're confessing that in your own strength and in your own power, you're powerless. And that's the point. You're powerless. You are powerless to do anything in your life. Only by the strength and grace of God. And so when you get on your knees and you humbly come before God in the quiet moments of your life, God looks down and he sees a humble person. And you know what God says? In scripture he says that those who humble themselves, I will lift them up. You see, God will give you grace to overcome the problems and circumstances in your life when you humble yourself. This is why I believe it's so on God's heart that we pray and fast and humble ourselves and seek God. So I implore you as the pastor to humble yourselves this week, to get on your knees. Yes, physically get on your knees in your office or at your home or wherever it may be and cry out to God and say, God, I need you. I can't do it in my own strength. This is what God wants and this is what God called Joshua to do, to ask the people to consecrate themselves in prayer, I believe in fasting and the little things of life, reading scripture on a consistent basis. You know, we produce a, a devotional, and we do it five days a week from Tuesday through Saturday, and you can sign up on our website. We'd love to have you participate with us. There's something to the consistency of reading scripture every day. Allowing God's word to come into your life. You see, it's those little things of prayer and fasting and reading scripture and being sensitive to the Holy Spirit that then if we do the little things in life, God will create great change in your circumstances. You see, oftentimes we get overwhelmed with wanting to do the big things in life. We want to see God do the great and wonderful things in life. But let's look at this scripture. It says this, that consecrate yourselves for tomorrow the Lord will do amazing things among you. You see, you can't do amazing things, but God can do amazing things. And when you position yourself in such a way that you said, I'm going to read the Bible, I'm going to pray, I'm going to fast, I'm going to seek God's face, then God can do amazing things because you consecrate yourself to him. You see, he begins to take an interest in what's going on in your life. And he wants to move powerfully through you. But you, you have to take it upon yourself to say, I'm going to consecrate. I'm going to set myself apart. I'm going to say no to certain things so I can say yes to the things that God has for me. This is why we pray. This is why we fast. This is why we get on our knees. This is all about reaching up. It's the word for the year. And I want us to reach up in greater intensity. Tonight we have a 
a, a prayer and fasting and a worship night from 6 to 7. And we have communion that's going to be here. And we are have different stations that we're going to be enjo- uh, asking you to participate in through prayer. It's going to be an engaging time. But it's also going to be a time where we're going to encourage you to boldly come before the throne of God on behalf of the things that maybe you might be dealing with in your own life. You see, if we do the little things in life, God will do the amazing things for us. Because in the eyes of God, little things are big things. In the eyes of God, little things are big things. Think about this. Jeremiah said this as he's prophesying. God is speaking through him. And God says this very clearly. He says, call to me and I will show you great and mighty things that you don't know about. You see, God wants to do great things through you, but he's calling you to consecrate yourself, to set yourself apart. And it's, I know it's easy in life to be fearful. It's easy to be afraid. Last week, I, I shared a little message about kind of the, the fear factor that sometimes we have. And I know many of you raised your hand and said, man, I want to be bold. I don't want to be fearful. And I was thinking about scripture and Oftentimes, God has to reiterate to us over and over again, don't be afraid, fear not. He commands it over and over in Scripture. He says, fear not, I'm with you. Fear not, stand and see the salvation of God. Fear not, for I've given them into your hands. Fear not, for God is fighting for you. Fear not, he will not fail you nor forsake you. Fear not, for those who are with us are more than those who are with them. Fear not, nor be dismayed because of this great multitude, for the battle is not yours, but God's. Fear not, for the Lord is with me. I'm not going to fear, because what can man do to me? Fear not, I'm with you. Don't anxiously look about you, for I am your God. I will strengthen you. Surely I will help you. I will uphold you by my righteous right hand. Don't fear, you're more valuable than many sparrows. You see, when we set ourselves apart for God, fear will flee. When you consecrate yourself to the Lord and you begin to hear what it is that he has for your life, fear has to flee. When we hear God's voice and when we get into his presence, amazing things begin to happen. And Joshua told the people, consecrate yourselves because amazing things are going to be happening. And so what happens? Joshua crosses through the Jordan on dry land because God does amazing things. You see, God will make a way in your circumstance where there is no way. But he's looking for you to consecrate yourself first, to get in his presence and to seek him I believe consecration was absolutely imperative to the victory that Joshua saw. When those walls came down, it wasn't because they were the best armament. It wasn't because even they shouted the loudest. It was because they consecrated themselves and recognized that it was God's power moving through them and going ahead of them to overcome their enemies. And you're going to be faced in life where you're going to have situations that seem so overwhelming to you. Maybe there's a medical condition, or maybe there's a financial situation, or maybe there's, you know, you fill in the blank. Maybe your kids have wandered away from the Lord. But as you begin to consecrate yourselves, as you begin to look towards God and not have fear, but be filled with faith, God will move through you and do amazing things. One pastor put it this way, if we do the little things like they are big things, then God will do the big things like they are little things. I love that. Can I say that again? If we do the little things, if we pray and fast and seek God's face, if we come before him humbly and get on our knees and say, God, we need your help, if we do the little things like they're big things, like they're the most important things, If you do those little things like they're the most important things, then I believe God will do the big things like they're no big deal. Your Jordan will become dry, and the walls in your life will come tumbling down. Jesus put it this way, if you're faithful in the little things, well, you'll be faithful in the large ones. But if you're dishonest in the little things, you won't be honest with greater responsibilities. How can God do greater things in your life unless you're willing to do the little things in life? You see, all of you, I'm sure you want to be close to God. You wouldn't be here 
if you didn't. You want, to, you want God to do amazing, great things in your life and in your family and in your kids and in your grandkids. You want that. I know you desperately do. But I'm calling us as a church to do the little things. If we can do the little things in life, then God will do the big things for you. So I say this again. Consecrate yourselves. Set yourselves apart. Get alone and pray and meditate. I love what St. Augustine, he was a a fourth century church father, he says this, pray as though everything depends on God and work as though everything depends on you. So I'm not just saying consecrate yourselves and don't do anything else. No, I'm saying you pray knowing that it depends on God and then you work as everything depends on you. See, God wants to work hand in hand with you to do the amazing thing in your life. I believe many of you, you need to be like Joshua Chamberlain in the 1800s who finds himself on Little Round Top, and you've got your back against the wall, and today in 2015, you know what God's calling you to do? He's not calling you to retreat or surrender. He's calling you to stand up, lift up the sword of the word, the word of God, and say, charge. God wants you to charge in life. He wants you to barrel down that mountain with no reserves and no regrets and no retreats. And he wants you to say to your problems, your Jordan, your Jericho, I'm going to go because the Lord's going to do great and mighty things that I can't even begin to imagine. As I consecrate myself, as I do the little things, God wants you to charge your marriage. He wants you to charge your family and your health and your circumstances. He wants us as a church to charge, to reach out into the city of Shawnee. This is what he's calling us as a church to do. Would you join me, church, in charging down the hill of your life and doing the things that God has called you to do. This is what we've been tasked with, church. And it's not just something that I'm trying to kind of pump you up. This is deeply spiritual. It's it's the little things of getting alone with God and allowing him to do the great big things in your life. Would you join with me in prayer? Father, I pray for those that are here that may be struggling with a little bit of fear, a little bit of anxiety. God, I ask that you would give them great courage in 2015. There may may be those of you that are here today and you're saying, I want courage in 2015. If that's you, I just want you to lift your hands. I want to pray for all of you that want that. Lord, you see these hands that are lifted high. It's between you and them. You know what areas of life they need courage in. And so, God, I pray, would you impart into them great courage? Lord, may they not be fearful or afraid or worried or looking over their shoulder. But, God, I pray that they would be men and women that would run headlong down the slope of life and do the very thing that you've called them to do. Father, fill them with your spirit. God, may they consecrate themselves to you. God, I pray that their Jordans and their Jerichos would melt before them. God, that you would do great and wonderful things in their lives this year in 2015 in the name of Jesus. And if you want that, said amen. Amen. Would you stand with me this morning? In just a few minutes, I'm going to release you, and there's a a parent meeting. So if you have children in our church anywhere from birth through sixth grade, there's going to be a parent meeting, and we really encourage you to go to that. There's going to be some important information that's going to be shared, and that's directly down the halls behind me, and you'll be able to do that. Also, if you've never given your life to Jesus... You're trying to think, well, where do we get this courage? Where does it come from? How can I consecrate myself? You see, let me give you this one last point. If you don't have Jesus in your life, you can do all the praying and all the consecrating and all the setting aside and getting all on your knees, and it doesn't amount to anything. You need Jesus, and Jesus is all of grace. He freely gives it to you. He freely gives you his spirit. You don't have to work for it. God wants to give it to you. And if that's you today and you've never received Christ, I'm going to encourage you to come forward here in just a few minutes. I want to pray with you and encourage you. Maybe if you're struggling with fear this morning, I want to encourage you to come forward as well. We want to pray for you that God would give you not a spirit of fear, but of courage and love and a sound mind 
that's what God wants to do in your life. So if I can encourage the prayer team to come forward, they'll come here in just a second and be praying you guys can come forward. And then if you can lift your hands, I want to bless you to go out this week in courage and boldness and doing what God's called you to do. Father, I pray for each one here, they'd be filled with your courage. I pray that they would love you and walk with you all the days of their life. Jesus, may they please you in everything, in the little things of life, so that you would do the big things. In Jesus' name, if you want that, say amen. Amen. God bless you. Have a wonderful day.